All right, let's say our let us soak the red Torah blessing together. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Praise to you, Lord our God, rule the universe, who's made us holy with your commandments, and command us to busy ourselves with the words of Torah. So, we're going to start off with a picture from Jerusalem. And this is a street corner in Talpiot, um, where the street is Beit Chogla. Now, as it turns out, Beit Chogla is a city that's mentioned in the book of Joshua. It's on the boundary between the territory allotted to the tribe of Benjamin and the territory allotted to the tribe of, Be of Judah just inside the Benjamin side. And it's near where the Jordan River meets the Dead Sea. I bring it to you though, because there's a connection or one could make a connection. Um, and so I'll leave it to you to figure out what the connection might be as we go on. Um, so the Dars of Tzolv Chad, on one foot, just so that we all have a basic understanding of what we're talking about. This is a biblical story from the Torah about women seeking change. And with that, we're going to begin with a prologue to our three-act story. <clears throat> Carol, would you read our prologue, please? The sons of Joseph were Manasseh and Ephraim by their clans, descendants of Manasseh, of Machir, the clan of Machirites, Machir begat Gilead, of Gilead, the clan of Gil Gileadites. These were the descendants of Gilead, of Lazar, Eazer, Eazer, the clan of Eazerites. Thank you, David, for letting me do this. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's a workout for your tongue. <laughs> of Helek, the clan of the Helekites, of Azrael, the clan of the Azraelites, Shechem, the clan of Shechemites, Shemida, the clan of Shemideites, of Hefer, the the clan of Hepharites. Really? Now, Silio, oh, please. Slow so, God. Thank you. Son of Hepher had no sons, only daughters. The names of Zalofechad's daughters were Machla, Machla Noah, Shogla, Milka, and Sirza. Those are the clans of Manasseh, men enrolled, 52,700. Okay. And a little context, please. Sure. This is from the biblical book of Numbers. This is in the middle of a census that Moses takes after wandering in the desert for 40 years so that there's an updated list of how many people will be taking part in the transition into the land of Israel. For our purposes, here's the genealogy of interest. Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph to Manasseh to Machir to to Gilead, to Hefer, to Tzalofahad, to the five daughters. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. So now that we've got a grounding on where these daughters fit in the grand scheme of the Jewish family tree, now we can get on to Act One. Oh. Taibo, would you read Act One, please? Here, we'll ask her for another time. Uh, Jesse, would you read Act One, please? Yep. <clears throat> the daughters of Sephlochad of Manasit or Manasite family, son of Hefer, son of Gilead son of Machir, son of Manasseh, son of Joseph, came forward. The names of the daughters were Malacha, Noah, 
Holga, Hogla, Milcha, and Tertza. They stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the chieftains, and the whole assembly at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And they said, our father died in the wilderness. He was not one of the faction, Korah's faction, which banded together against Adonai, but died for his own sin, and he has left no sons. Let not our father's name be lost to his clan just because he had no son. Give us a holding among our father's kinsmen. Okay. Context. This is from the biblical book of Numbers, right after the census. The issue is that only sons could inherit land at that point. So if a man didn't have any sons, then his land would disappear from the family. In the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva tries to connect Slifochad, who died for unspecified reasons, with the unnamed man who was killed for gathering sticks on Shabbat. This is like the Disney Midrash where people try to connect Disney movies. Um, so part one, or question one, history and stories is not inevitable. People make choices. At what points could this part of the story have turned out differently? Thank you. Lefelchad could have had sons, but that's not possible anymore. He wasn't no longer around. The daughters could have held their top or could have not advocated on behalf of themselves and just let the the, the land be lost. Where would they have lived if they had done that? I'm sorry, say that again, Herb? Where would the daughters have resided in oh. Israel if they had not said something? They would have had a place, they would not have a place to live, supposedly. Mm -hmm. They were neither strangers, widows, nor orphans. Well, they were orphans, I guess. Have lived with other clan members. Presumably, at this period, family units are still divided into clan structures, so they could have just lived with their other other family members. Potentially, if um, Zilof Zilof had had like if he had like a brother or something, they could have lived with with them. If they needed to. Although I'm not I'm not sure how the if there was such a I don't know, like an ingrained welfare system with the clans. I don't know how they operated in cases like that. I'm not sure. Question, David. Their father died for his own sin. Do we have any idea what that sin was? So we don't from the Torah. Um, Rabbi Akiba in the Talmud says that the sin that he died for was because he gathered sticks on Shabbat and this was a capital crime. And he does, and he makes this claim because there is somebody, there is a man who is killed for this earlier in the Torah, I think in the book of Exodus maybe, and he doesn't have a name that's given for him. And here we have a guy with a name who has no sin specifically given for him. And so it's put together. Um, if, he, if he had lived in Egypt as a slave, then he would have died for the sin of just being a slave in Egypt and supposedly speaking against the uh, 12 uh, spies. That's true. That is a very good point. One that I'm not sure why the rabbis of the Talmud didn't think of themselves. Um, the other idea that was presented in the Talmud was that um, when, after the story of the spies, when one spy from each tribe went out to check out the land of Israel, which we're going to be, oh no, we read about this already, so I'm not spoiling, not giving any spoilers away. Uh, um, and they all saw the same thing and 10 of them came back and said, it's a very nice place, but it's impossible to get in and we're doomed. And 
two of them came back and said, it's a very nice place and it's going to be tough to get in, but we think we can handle it. And everybody else was like, ah, we're doomed. <laughs> Moses, why did you take us out to the wilderness where there are not enough graves in Egypt? Which is the first example of biblical sarcasm. And so uh, then God gets really upset and is like, okay, clearly you people don't have any faith in me and you don't have any faith in yourself. And you're all thinking like slaves. And so all of you are gonna wander around for the next 40 years and die. And your kids who are under the age of 20 will grow up believing in themselves, believing in me, and they'll be the ones to go in, plus the two spies who had faith in me, namely Joshua, who becomes the leader after Moses, and Caleb. So that's where the story usually ends. However, little known sequel, the people are like, we're sorry, we're sorry. We'll try to go in right now just to prove how much we believe in you. And God's like, no, bad idea, don't. And we're like, we're not listening. We're going in because we want to show you how much we believe in you. And then they get beaten by the, um, the previous, I think the Amal Amalekites, um, somebody, some desert tribe, beats them off and a bunch of them die. And so a different rabbi, Shmuel maybe, Eliezer, I don't remember exactly who, um, responds to Rabbi Akiva, it's like, no Rabbi Akiva, that's not what, why this guy died. So Ochad died because he was in that fight. And also Rabbi Akiva, it's not nice of you to name the part, to say the person that the Torah didn't name because either the Torah didn't want to embarrass the guy by giving him a name, or that's not actually Tzolchad. So either way, you messed up Akiba. Akiba is not recorded as having a response. Uh, um, but that is the discussion about why Tzolchad died. However, given that the simplest explanation is often the one that makes the most sense, I would say, Herb, that your thought that, well, he was old enough that he was gonna die anyway, makes a perfectly good explanation and maybe the world's newest midrash. Can I patent it? No, but it's going on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number two. How might the daughters of Tzolchad have felt as they stood before Moses and everybody else to make their claim? But they had the support of each other, so that might have helped some. It wasn't just one single person. Indignant that they had to do it because there was no brother? I think they probably had a profound sense of, of just love for God and his justice. That, they're, that that doing all this in the first place um, would be meaningful because of their trust in, in God's character um, and, and also in Moses to be able to do this at all. Some people, maybe they don't want to try to even talk to their leaders either because of a lack of faith in, in, the, in leadership or perhaps because of, of, uh, of, of a feeling that maybe the leadership isn't going to respond at all, but them, them coming forward to bring forward this concern just shows how much they trust, not only this system, but you know the primary people involved, Moses, the prophet, and, and God himself, who Moses is serving. So that's what I see in this, uh, I think, is, is the potential feeling that, that, the, 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 that the daughters had. Considering that there was no ju so-called justice for women Previously, they would have had to have a lot of a cuts, but to even approach Moses. Mm -hmm. Unless you consider the justice of, of that a woman has attained in the past was when uh, the whole tribe, the whole Shechem got slaughtered after they were uh, circumcised because of having raped 
uh, the, uh, what's her name? Yeah. Tina. Yeah. I was going to say, I would just thought in general, these sisters probably felt very apprehensive, but at the same time that they were hopeful. And I think a lot of that was due to Moses and his um, leadership. It, it strikes me that, that they made the choice to go out of their way to say their father committed a sin. They might have just said he died in the wilderness. And it's a striking fact that they uh, present themselves as the daughters of a, uh, yeah, of, a, of a, an offender, a sinner, uh, uh, which might be thought to give them actually more credit because they're saying, this is who we are. We're not making any excuses, uh, but we're entitled to our share. So what the hell they felt, I don't know, but uh, of course, but but they present their case in what might look like a uh, an unexpected way, but I think is is very effective for that reason. I suspect that these women were very prepared, that they took the time to really study the situation, knowing the history of their own people and knowing Moses and how to approach him. They didn't just suddenly say, oh, we got to go talk to Moses. They really prepared. I would think they had to make their case or push their way through Moses's lieutenants and crowds of people and they had to be pretty assertive to get from wherever they wherever their tribe was in the assembly to get to the front or, or the middle or wherever it was that Moses was but have to get through his his retinue um, because I'm, you know, I'm sure he had some people around him who, who uh, helped helped him, helped control his calendar, whatever, whatever we, you know, use as a modern uh, uh, example. Um, so it wasn't just, you know, gonna, we're going to go see Moses, but we have to. You know, we have to make our way and and uh, convince an awful lot of people before we get to even see him. I think the fact that there were five of them helped. <clears throat> like. <clears throat> All right, next question. How might God feel being told that God is wrong and making decisions that hurt people? <laughs> Maybe he did it on purpose so to see what would happen. Maybe he knew what would happen since he knows everything. Mm. Reliant on a little bit of a process theology perspective, maybe this is just a development in that, you know, in, in the process of revelation itself, maybe perhaps God didn't know that this would happen, but it sort of just spontaneously occurred. And God in his justice and his omnibenevolence knew the best response, which would be to listen to them, which I don't know if that's a little bit of a spoiler, but that's that's the way I would see it maybe you know they never say that uh, the rules that have been laid down 
are incorrect, and that's how it occurs to me. Uh, they simply say their case wasn't considered, their situation, that the, the, the fact pattern of their case. And if God is the, uh, as Abraham says, the judge of uh, all the world, he should do justice, he has to consider the um, a concrete case. And you can't consider all the concrete cases when you're laying down rules, no matter, even if you know everything, because you'd, you'd make endlessly long lists of rules. That's not acceptable. Uh, that's not workable. So you have to sometimes act like a common law judge and deal with the concrete case and see how the general rules apply. Uh, and so arguably that's that's what they're doing. That may be a stretch, but uh, you have to let this lawgiver, uh, you have to give him the benefit of the doubt. David, we were told earlier on that uh, through Moses' father-in-law, Moses set up a whole hierarchy of courts or judges, if you will, that people had to go through to get to Moses. So wouldn't the daughters have had to go through those various steps before they actually reached Moses? Yes. And although it's not recorded that they did so, the Midrashim about them, or there, there are Midrashim about them, about the situation that start with that process of them working their way up through the appeals course, the appeals courts until they finally get up to Moses. That is a good connection and point. I guess the moral of the story is all fathers should have at least one son. No, the moral of the story is give the daughters equal uh, equal rights. Right. Maybe I'm not being optimistic here um, about God. But maybe God realized that he did an injustice at making that law stick and that these five women deserve an opportunity to show that women can stand up for what they believe is injustice towards them. And maybe God said, this is a good example of what women can do when they've seen injustice, even if I created it. Maybe God is a woman. How do we know? <laughs> All right, Abba, would you read our second act, please? Most struck their case before Hashem. Hashem said to Moses, the plea of Tzlafchad's daughters is just. You should give them a hereditary holding among their father's kinsmen. Transfer their father's share to them. Further, speak to the Israelite people as follows. If a householder dies without leaving a son, you shall transfer his property to his daughter. If he has no daughter, you shall assign his property to his brothers. If he has no brothers, you shall assign his property to his father's brothers. If his father has no brothers, you shall assign his property to his nearest relative in his own clan, who shall inherit it. This shall be the law of procedure for the Israelites in accordance with Hashem's command to Moses. Okay. So he's, he's giving new rights to daughters, but not to women. Well, that depends how you define nearest relative. The nearest relative might be a woman. But isn't he? Isn't it saying if he dies without a son, you give it to his daughter. If he has no daughter, to his brothers. If he has no brothers, to his father's brothers. Not if he has no brothers but sisters, give it to the sister. That's correct. 
But it says if he has no brothers to his nearest relative, his nearest relative after that might be a sister. <laughs> or a niece. Okay, you're whatever. Right. Okay. But it's still it it still it takes it down a notch. It doesn't it, it's like what's left over. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. it doesn't seem equal in the way it's written that women have the same right as any of the male relatives. That's it true. The right. Of the heap there. So, so it was a baby step. All right. At what points could this part of the story have turned out differently? God could have said no. Moses could refuse to ask God. All right. So Korah also makes a claim against Moses. This was what we read two days ago. His claim against Moses is that Moses has taken on too much power and that Moses shouldn't actually be in charge and neither should Aaron for that matter. And instead Korah should be in charge. Korah makes his claim angrily with 250 men to back him up, and he get, ends up getting swallowed by the earth. How are these situations different, and how is this applicable today? Korach's argument was not for the sake of heaven, whereas a daughter's argument was for the sake of heaven. It's also so, startling how how forward thinking this is giving given the fact that there are still societies today where women don't have as many property rights as our Bible gives these daughters of Slavkad. In many societies throughout the world, women are simply treated like property, and in some societies they're actually outright uh killed if they open their mouths about anything and that you know this whole story is supposed to have happened about uh, 3,000 years ago it's amazingly forward thinking you know this is odd because I couldn't get a credit card in the 60s unless my husband signed for it a good friend of mine couldn't buy a house in the 60s, she could get a loan from a bank because she was a woman and she fought like hell and she got the loan. So this may seem old, but to me it's also quite present in various parts of the country and parts of the world. It hasn't changed much at all. That's right. When Howard got out of the army in 1961, I went to Marshall Fields to open up a credit card and they wouldn't let me. <laughs> they told me, no, your husband has to do it. And that was 1961. <laughs> When I moved to Maryland in 1987 and bought a house and arranged by the house before I was married, and then I could leave it, I may get it wrong, but leave it to my, whatever heirs I wanted to leave it to, but I happened to marry after I signed the contract and then it had, Maryland changed the way the house had to be left and it had to go to my sp male spouse. And that was 87. Wow. Mm 
Um, well, David, I guess the question I have is that in other parts of the Torah, you know, if, if a woman is, is married or if she's not married and she's still living with her father, he pretty much, uh, has control over, you know, what she does and, and, you know, any vows that she might make. Um, so I, I guess uh, the fact that they have, the fact that the daughters have the property uh, gives them some rights, but only, I mean, like what happens if they marry? Mm. But didn't it say in the text we may not have it that they were constrained they had to marry no them. no we haven't we haven't gotten that far yet we will whoops <laughs> before we get to there i'm going to push my original question a little bit more. Thinking about how we discussed at the beginning, or you, you wrote at the beginning, ways to make change. Korach wanted to make change. The doors of Shochad wanted to make change. Korach wanted to make change by overthrowing Moses by saying, Moses, you shouldn't be in charge. I should be in charge. I've got 250 men to back me up and say that I should be in charge, not you. Didn't end well for Korach. He also seemed a bit angry, although it's not always easy to tell exactly tone of voice from written text. Um, Dars of Tzodchad, come in with a with, with a less <clears throat> aggressive approach working within the system and they get what they're looking for so when in what situations today would these approaches be relevant. But David, the, the Korach story, Korach, you know, Korach had a beef with Moses, mm -hmm. but it was God who selected Moses. Mm -hmm. And if Korach didn't like Moses being the leader, he should have taken it up with God and said, God, I should be the leader, and this is why. Instead, he threatened Moses. God didn't like it. God opened up the earth, and, you know, it swallowed Korach and his followers. So it's really a different kind of thing. The, 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 the daughters went to Moses to plead their case because they couldn't go to God. And, you know, Moses went to God to say, you know, I don't know how to handle this one. What do I do? If Gorach would have perhaps figured out a way to go to God, the story might have been different. That's true. Mm -hmm. It's possible that Korach might have felt like the Jordan of Tzolchad, that Moses was the one who could talk to God, not them, or not him. <laughs> and it's also possible that Korach might have felt that God didn't actually want Moses to be in charge, 
Moses just like took the power himself. Did Moses tell God, who am I to lead these people? Or go talk to Pharaoh? A man who can't even speak straight. It's true. Korah wasn't there at the time to hear that, but yes, that's true. I can contribute something from um, some Torah study that the rabbi who has replaced me at the synagogue from which I retired um, mentioned in his sermon this past weekend. Um, he talks about he talked about the fact that as the Torah was being put together, it reflects different streams of tradition and that there are ways of looking at the Korach story as saying, um, and scholars who know far more about the Hebrew language of the time than I do um, know how to look at this stuff, but that there's this stream of tradition and that stream of tradition about how the leadership developed during the, the 40 years mm -hmm. and that um, the final result, the way the Torah comes down to us is that it was made into a uh, an engaging story um, using Korach as the fall guy, so to speak, no pun intended since he got the earth open under him, but that what was really going on was different streams of competition for leadership among the priests and among the political factions and mm -hmm. all those things that uh, those of us who have enough trouble with modern Hebrew uh, can't even see in the um, underpinnings of the biblical Hebrew of the Torah. But I thought it was a fascinating approach to it. Mm -hmm. May I push that language question uh, uh, more narrowly uh, uh, in verse five, now that it's been raised, because it says Moses uh, brought near or he brought the case Hashem, before the Lord. Uh, but the their case is, if I understand this, the translation, at Mishpatan. Uh, so it, now that end, that noon at the end, is is the feminine so it's their case the feminine the women's case right but it's but i think that the nun there is large in the torah text because it's in the in the text i'm looking at the same one is basically as yours uh it has a footnote it's saying i think it means it's it's large rather it's it's full long nun as if to say and I don't know if the rabbis comment on this, maybe you're aware of this, uh, that to draw attention to the fact that it's, because you don't usually see it, that it's a uh, the case of the women as as females. Is that is that part of this uh, story that people tell that about the text? I don't know. That, that would make sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for noticing that, yeah. bringing that up. All right, so do you foresee any issues with this solution about the solution in, the, in Act 2 that if there's a son, the, the son gets the property as an inheritance. If there's no son, the daughter gets the property. People contest it, you know, like people do today. The father's brothers, if they decided that they should have it rather than the daughters. Hmm. And to go speak before the Sanhedrin or whoever else would be. Yeah. It still seems. Go ahead, Marilyn. 
it still seems unfair to me because if there's both daughters and sons, the do the sons inherit the property, and then the daughters have to uh, depend on the benevolence of the sons to take care of them, at least till they get married. No, I don't think anyone disagrees with that. That that is to say, that's the the rule, and the only reason these daughters get this special or this different treatment is that uh, otherwise their their father's property goes seems to go nowhere on the rule as they as it's been stated, and uh, it's not just the default rule. As as Marilyn says, the um, uh, if you have a bunch of sisters, and I, I think uh, Alan made this point earlier, if you if you know, if you have sisters, uh, they, they don't get it. You look for you keep looking for a brother until you run out of males. That's the rule. It's not a it's not much of a feminist rule, uh, but it is a way of addressing a specific kind of problem. Uh, we we you know we shouldn't shut our eyes to what it, what kind of rule it is. It's not answered here as if the daughters never marry or never. Oh, what then would happen to the property when they pass on? Mm. It looks like then it goes to. Um, nearest relative in, in the father's clan. Which is a man, it would seem, from the text. Actually. Yes. It could be a woman. Well, I don't, not, not likely. I mean, it's, at least it's, a, at least it's a masculine gender if you follow it through. So Until you get to the end of it where it says the nearest relative if there's no, there's no brothers around. Well, it's true that they, they, budget a bit in the English, but that's the natural way. I, I don't want to put too much on this point because that's the default gender, I think, in, in Hebrew verbs, but I don't know how far you go with that. Yes. I and... So right. does, I, yeah. David, before we go on to the next, and I, I would like that to happen, but they're giving, if there's no son, you transfer the property to his daughter, but it is that the eldest daughter? If there is, because here you have five daughters, are they splitting the property equally? Does it go to the eldest daughter? If, when the eldest daughter dies, does it go get split among those other four? Or does it get dispersed to their clansmen instead? Mm -hmm. you know, there's, a, there's a lot that's not said here that even with this this specific case uh leaves a lot to lot that's unclear yes yes, yes thank you yes, that, 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 okay, that is, now we can move on <laughs> i think that it's that it depends on how it works for sons. If there, if this property is divided equally among sons, then be divided equally amongst daughters. <clears throat> if only the eldest son gets the property, then only the eldest daughter would get the property. Okay. But I thought the eldest son gets a double share and all the other sons get a single share of the estate. That's possible. I don't know how biblical inheritance worked, but I'll see what I can find. All right, let's go into act three. Tybo, would you read please? Yes, I did wanna say, I think biblical inheritance did work that way with the double until Jacob's sons, because Ruvain didn't get the double. So that was upending it all. And then Joseph's mm. sons. So, in theory, it worked that way. And that's why it was a problem with Asa. Anyway, because he was the eldest. He was born first, you know, the twins. Okay. 
Um, the family heads in the clan of the descendants of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Anasa, one of the Joseph. I think we lost her. Um, um, family heads of the Israelites. They said, yod heh vav -Hey commanded my Lord to assign the land to the Israelites as shares by lot. And my Lord was further commanded by yod heh vav -Hey to assign the share of our kinsman Zalophachad to his daughters. Now, if they become the wives of persons from another Israelite tribe, their share will be cut off from our, our ancestral portion and be added to the portion of the tribe into which they become explanation wise. Thus our allotted portion will be diminished. And even when the Israelites observe the Jubilee, their share will be added to that of the tribe into which they became wives and their share will be cut off from the ancestral portion of our tribe. <laughs> So Moses at yud heh vav -Heh's bidding instructed the Israelites saying, the plea of the Josephite tribe is just, this is, I'll have to see where, oh top yeah, of uh, at the top. What yud heh vav -Heh has commanded concerning the daughters of Tzalofahad. They may become the wives of anyone they wish, provided they become wives within a clan of their father's tribe. No inheritance of the Israelites may pass over from one tribe to another, but the Israelite heirs, each of them, must remain bound to the ancestral portion of their tribe. Every daughter among the Israelite tribes who inherits a share must become the wife of someone from a clan of her father's tribe in order that every Israelite heir may keep an ancestral share. Thus, no inheritance shall pass over from one tribe to another, but the Israelite tribe shall remain bound each to its portion. The daughters of Zalovachad did as yod heh vav -Heh had commanded Moses, Machla, Tertza, Chogla, Milka, and Noah. Zalovachad's daughters became the wives of their uncle's sons, becoming... Oops. Wives within clans of descendants of Manasseh, son of Joseph, and so their share remained in the tribe of their father's clan. These are the commandments and regulations that yod heh vav -Heh enjoined upon the Israelites through Moses on the steps of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho. Thank you. All right. In recognition of the time, I'll just do a little bit of talking to wrap up. So first of all, this is the end of the book of Numbers. Second of all, this is a trailer bill, as we talked about in politics, where there was a problem that if the daughters inherited land and they married a guy from another tribe, then they took their land with them into the other tribe's territory. And the other tribe now owned land within, within the original territory. So the tribe of Manasseh didn't want their land disappearing because daughters were marrying into other tribes. So Moses said, okay, you're right and you're right. Daughters can still inherit land if there are no sons, but they have to marry within their father's tribe so that the land stays within the tribe, preferably within the clan. So that's how that turned out. Now, eventually this law got repealed and the date that it got repealed was on the 15th of the month of Av, Tuba Av. This becomes one of the explanations for why Tuba Av becomes a day of love, because it's a day in which people can marry whomever they desire within the Israelite nation. Um, and there's, a, I'll include a source sheet that I created about Tuba Av, so you can read about that further. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as an epilogue, in the book of Joshua, when the tribes are given their land in the land of Israel, we see that the daughters, Machla, Noah, Chokla, Milka, and Tirza, come before Joshua and Eliezer the priest and the chieftains and say, 
God commanded Moses to give us a portion amongst our male kinsmen, and then they get it. So it takes a little bit more self-advocacy, but they do get what they were supposed to get. As an appendix, I've put this into Reader's Theater so you can see it in script form. Um, and finally, bringing this full circle back to the sign at the beginning, Chogwa of Beit Chogwa. Chogwa was one of the daughter's names. Oh. Mm. So, we come I mean, full circle. It's H, there's no CH, right? I know. Yeah. It's a it's a CH in it's a CH in the, the Hebrew okay. um, or KH maybe. In English, yeah. But yeah, that 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 does throw things off. Okay. 